welcome everybody to our NCO webinar. Uh, we, this is the first webinar of our NCO online uh, and I'm delighted to be joined by three amazing musicians and great friends of mine. Kate Southers, hi Kate. Hi everyone. Uh, Joe Patton, hi Joe. Hi everyone. And Simon Blendis, hi Simon. Hi everyone. We'll, we'll uh, introduce ourselves all in a minute. Um, fantastic to be kicking off our webinars. The title of this one is There is no I in team and it's all about teamwork and how orchestras work together and these are very th three very experienced orchestral musicians. So I'm going to start off by introducing my friend Joe, who is one of my best friends and one of my favorite, most favorite people in the whole world. Um, she is the um, principal second clarinet, is that right, of the City of Birmingham Symphony Orchestra? Yeah. And um, she, we've been colleagues for many years, and she is probably the most happy, optimistic, joyful, wonderful, creative people that I know. So that's Jo. Wowzers! That's so super kind. Thank you. Um, I might just let this out right now. I have to say that I always call Kath Bezzy. So if I do it by accident, that's who I'm referring to. So Catherine Arledge, super, super violinist, super musician, incredible. Um, writer, super efficient, really great mum, super great fun and some of my most happy times have been generally running around a lake in Europe with her just chatting and talking about all sorts. Thank you Bezzy. <laughs> right over to you guys. I think I'm up next. I'm going to introduce the wonderful Simon Blenders, who not only is a cracking violinist, he's also one of the nicest people you can hope to work with. And I have a little spiel here for you. He has been fortunate enough to combine orchestral playing with chamber music. He led the Schubert Ensemble for 23 years, which is piano and strings and the same personnel throughout the whole time. Check them out on YouTube. You can subscribe to their channel. Um, and he has been leader of London Mozart Players since 2014. And just in the last 12 months, he's led the LSO, the RPO, the Halle, the BBC Phil and the Royal Northern Symphonia. So I'm sure that coronavirus is maybe a nice break for him to have a rest. Uh, and he also <laughs> enjoys directing from the violin, um, which he does with Mozart players, but also does with Scottish Ensemble and Academy of Smart Martin in the Fields. And he's a teacher and he's a professor at Guildhall. Thanks very much, Kate. And I'm going to introduce Kate, who I work with in CBSO, who's the most delightful and wonderful principal second violin. Um, and I know all about Kate because it's written down here. So Kate was actually born in Sydney and raised in Sydney, Australia. And in 2016, she was appointed the section leader of the second violins in the City of Birmingham Symphony Orchestra. Um, and this was only a year after she'd finished, in, st finished studying at the Royal Academy of Music. So she was extremely young to get that position. Um, I imagine. So whilst at the Academy she co-founded the Artesian Quartet which she has led for 10 years. Um, Kate loves music making in all its forms whether it's playing symphonies from memory with the Aurora Orchestra or combining music and dance with a Scottish ensemble. Um, I haven't seen Kate dance actually but I'll see if that's one's on YouTube. You have to look that up. Um, or she pretends to be a ranger in Jurassic Park for the CBSO Notebooks concerts or recording music for films like The Avengers and James Bond. Uh, Kate's been a soloist at the Cheltenham Festival. She's led chamber concerts at Whitmore Hall in King's Place and is frequently invited to perform as a guest principal player with ensembles, including the BBC Symphony Orchestra, BBC National Orchestra of Wales, Scottish Ensemble, London Symphonietta and the Birmingham Contemporary Music Group. Um, and she's only ever wanted to play the violin. Isn't that really lovely? I'm sure lots of you are like that. Um, but will allow for certain other pastimes, including travelling, reading and baking which is something her section in the CBSO are particularly good at, which is something I do remember from playing with the CBSO. I don't think they offered their cakes to the first violins. We might have to talk about that later. It depends what week it is, Simon, to be honest. Sometimes we're very protective okay. of sugar. Yeah. Quite right, too. So that's Kate. Great. Our numbers are going up a little bit. So just if you've just joined us, thank you so much for joining us. We, we have been killing a bit of time um, because we know you've had a bit of trouble getting in to the webinar. So... Uh, we'll get going now. I'm going to start by screen sharing a little bit about our guests and perhaps um, first of all, Simon, you could just tell us a little bit about about you growing um, up. What was your musical journey? Gosh, okay. Um, I started by playing violin when I was just four um, because we found a teacher who lived around the corner um, and he agreed to, take, to teach me and my twin brother 
um, even though um, he hadn't teach, taught anyone that young before. Extraordinarily, it was the same teacher that Kath also started with, I believe, um, and his name was Peter Watman. Um, and he was amazing, he got us all going. He had a lot of students um, gradually at that age and he put together little string orchestras and we had a great time. This is a photo of me when I was 11, I think on something called Pro Corda, which I joined when I was 10, which was the National Chamber Music School. And I kept going there every summer until I was 18. And that's where I really loved playing every kind of chain music quartets. And that's what I basically grew up doing. Um, and so when I, I went to Cambridge, did a music degree, then I studied in Toronto, and then I came back and joined the Schubert Ensemble. Um, so I was just 24. Wow, that's a bit more recent, less hair. Um, so anyway, so chain music was what I've always done, but then I did start the lead some orchestras and was very lucky, got asked to lead various different orchestras. That's me with the London Mozart players. On the left, that was quite a trendy gig where we had to wear black t-shirts and we were mic'd up. Um, and so for the last 20 years, I've actually been combining chamber music with leading orchestras and it's been incredibly fun and interesting and rewarding. Um, and I Brilliant. consider myself a, a lucky boy. Thank you. Yeah. Um, let's move on to Joe. Here's Joe. What was tell us about that picture, Joe? <laughs> this is just so funny because when I found this picture, I thought, "Gosh, I look really old." And so I was actually only twelve at that point. Like I was exactly the same size and the same build as I am now. Like I haven't, like obviously I've got loads more wrinkles, but essentially I'm exactly the same size as I was when I was then. Isn't that ridiculous? So I think I had just won some competition, a local competition. And so that's a clipping from a newspaper. <laughs> and tell us about this. Okay, so um, that was part of the CBSO tour. And that is the really super hall, um, the Music Verein in Vienna, where the New Year's Day concert always comes from. And I think that was our section photo because that was a really special tour for us. Ah, so this is a bit different. Um, so this is my most recent picture because we did a little digital project, kind of like what all you guys are doing this week. We did one with the orchestra last week. And so our task was really broad, just to go and create some content. And so we were really lucky. We found this piece by Nigel Wood, who's also a Birmingham composer. And he gave us permission to perform his piece and it's called Swanky. So we thought we'd combine the old Mercedes, the bit of graffiti, bit cool kind of environment and go and play Swanky in a car park in Digbeth in Birmingham. And it was great fun. Amazing. Thank you, Joe. So Kate, how cute is this picture? Where was this taken? Um, I think this is in a town called Wagga Wagga um, in New South <laughs> Wales in Australia, which did a summer music school every year. Um, I think I was eight in that picture and I'm playing the bark double, apparently. Um, wow. I started playing the violin when I was three uh, and I, I actually wanted to play the cello um, because my older brother plays the cello and so he, I'd, I'd heard it all my life and so my parents tricked me and said, what about the tiny cello, which was a violin. So that's how I ended up playing the violin. Oh, and that, um, that is actually the very first time I played with the CBSO. That is Andres's last week, Andres Nelson's. Uh, it's Marla three rehearsals. And that was my very first time in with the amazing orchestra that I can now call my family. But. Oh, and another one. Uh, yes, you can see my <laughs> electric haircut very well. Uh, that is um, a lovely group of musicians, all from the CBSO. And we uh, are about to play uh, Souvenir de Florence, I think. That was last year. Great, amazing. Thank you so much, guys. Um, now, what we're going to be talking about today is three things, really. There's no I in team, and in under that title, we're going to be talking about the roles that there are within the orchestra, the relationships within the orchestra, especially relationships with the conductors, and also preparation, how we prepare. Okay, so I'm going to come out of the screen share and ask Simon, who's, who has led quite a lot of orchestras, tell us um, what, does, what does a leader do, Simon? Yeah, I'm often asked this, and I think it's quite a mysterious thing because I'm not really sure myself. Um, but I, I like to think there are a few fundamentals that the leader has to be able to do. I mean, the first thing is to lead the first violins and in leading, just to be really clear where you're playing and how you're playing so that they have something very obvious to follow and to fit in. Um, I think that the leader is often a link between the orchestra players and the conductor. So I quite often get sort of fed questions from members of the orchestra and they're expecting me to ask the questions for them. 
Um, and so quite a lot of rehearsal, I spend filtering out questions that I think are going to wind the conductor up um, and then asking the ones that I think are good questions. Um, and that's acting as the kind of mediator between a poll has come up. Is this where I stop and say a poll has come oh, up? Oh, yes, a poll. Fantastic. A poll has been launched. So it looks like um, all our guests have the same favourite place to travel to on tour. Is it Japan, America, Argentina, Spain or Austria? OK, so we're going to find out what that answer is while Simon carries on telling us. You're, you're, you're filtering questions for the conductor. What else do you do? So I think the most sort of mysterious element of leading an orchestra is interpreting the conductor's beat. Um, because some conductors are much clearer than others um, and some conductors need a little bit of help I think sometimes um, to get everybody really playing together so I'm sometimes aware that um, the orchestra has sort of got half an eye on where I'm going to play um, as the leader of the orchestra and so the most important thing is just to be incredibly consistent and incredibly clear about where you're playing um, and sometimes I've, I test this out sometimes if I'm playing with a conductor I think it's really brilliant I try not to move at all and um, that usually works quite well um, and then suddenly I realise it's not working and I have to start sort of indicating a little bit more. Um, so I think the most important thing is not to overlead. I think that can be very distracting. Um, but I think just being very, very clear about where I'm playing does tend to help the orchestra um, just stay together. But I think possibly the most important thing a leader does is actually to create an atmosphere um, of sort of positivity, um, if that's not too current a word. Um, because I've, I remember, you know, I, when I first started working, of course, I was at the back of the segments. And I used to be aware sometimes if there was a leader that would be a bit snarky towards the conductor or sort of try and trip them up or try and catch them out. Um, and it became a sort of battle sometimes between the leader that thought they were great and the conductor that thought they were more great. Um, and I was always aware that this created quite a tension. And I think it's really important that everybody is on the same side and the conductors are human beings too and like to be supported and, and nurtured and, and felt appreciated. Um, and so I think part of the job of the leader actually is just to make sure everyone's pulling in the same direction, everyone's on the same side, and that there's a really great positive working atmosphere going on. Great, thank you so much Simon. So we have the results of our poll. 37% think Japan, and closely behind that, 23 Austria, 23 Spain, 11 Argentina and 6 America. So uh, who's, uh, you probably didn't know this about each other, but Joe, do you want to tell us what the answer is? I think it could be Japan. <laughs> yes, isn't that amazing? These guys get That's these amazing. questions right every time. I don't know how they do it, but they do. So yeah, absolutely right. Bang on. Um, their favourite place to go is Japan. Why? Why, Kate? Why do you love Japan? Oh, it. I think it combines lots of wonderful things about touring. So it, there are wonderful halls. There are very appreciative audiences, which is always a really nice thing to perform to and, a, and nice spaces to perform in. You're really well looked after. The hospitality is unbelievable um and i think also it's so different to you know to to our everyday realities and things that the food is amazing the culture is amazing the, the landscape is so totally different and it makes the time the downtime when touring sort of incredibly exciting and yeah it's, it's brilliant i love it amazing Great, thank you. So Kate, tell us about leading a section in an orchestra, like leading the second violins, for example. T tell us what you, what you do in that role. Well, I think Simon's covered some of the things that I, I think good section principals do as well. So it's about being clear for your section, filtering the questions and being clear and consistent. I think leading the seconds is an interesting job because you have, so you, you sort of need to have a hundred eyes or something, you know, an eye on the leader, an eye on the conductor, an eye on the other principal string players, because you do a lot with the violas, um, and also making sure you keep initiative for the moments, because second violins often have these amazing textural roles of, of tempo and, and drive and everything. Um, so, you know, making sure that you know, when you see something coming up in the music that, you know, there's a, there's a tempo change or something kind of coming into yourself and then being able to lead in a way that's sometimes separate to the rest of the orchestra is, is a different skill as well. But. Fantastic. And Joe, tell us about the roles of wind and brass players, because you, it's a bit different to strings, isn't it? Because you all have your own parts and you've got a little bit more individuality anyway. Tell us, tell us about your role. Well, you, you make a great point. So I guess the fundamental difference between a wind and brass player and a string player is, like you say, we have a kind of individual responsibility so 
whilst um, I guess there isn't that kind of safety in numbers that you might find as part of a bigger section, somehow maybe there is a little bit more freedom and a different way to communicate as a Wind and Brass player. And I think one of those things that I find really interesting is how we all start to just move with each other when we play somehow. It's like, it's a really kind of subconscious thing, but you start to see people just sort of move rhythmically or move with the same kind of um, style to help kind of interpret what we're trying to achieve at any given time. Thank you, Joe. So leadership is kind of, you're all having to show leadership in different roles within the orchestra in different ways. How, Simon, would you define leadership? What, what is leadership? Good it's question. a really interesting question, a difficult question. Someone said recently that re leadership is not where you sit, it's a personality trait. And I think that's a really important distinction, that just because you sit in a leader's chair doesn't make you a leader. Um, and I think possibly the most important thing about a leader is somebody who kind of inspires other people, who inspires confidence and trust, and who brings people together um, so that you create a kind of unified sense of participation. And the leader, once you've done that, I think if you're confident enough to show the way, then people will come with you on that journey. Um, but it's about unifying people, enabling people, and creating a sort of team feeling um, that's possibly the most important thing about leadership. Fantastic. Oh, great. Look, we've got another poll. This one is about <laughs> Joe. Secret about Joe. So oh, Joe loves biscuits. Her favourite are, look at them all voting, jammy dodgers, malted mi milk, custard creams, chocolate hobnobs, digestives or party rings. Okay, so we're going to find out the favourite biscuit of Joe in just a minute. Now, Joe, uh, while they're voting on you and your biscuits, uh, <laughs> how, much, how much can you make your solos your own? If you're, if you're a wind player and you've got a solo, like I know you've had lots of for example, E flat clarinet solos, big, big solos. How how can you make them your own? And how much do conductors try and shape what it is that you're doing? Um, so I, I might just, if I if I can, just sort of slightly take over from where Simon left off in this idea of leadership, because I think for me, the whole idea of playing in an orchestra is kind of like this huge cooperative where no part of it can work without the other. And I think, um, you know, when you're playing, when you're playing a solo or when you're, I don't know, it's kind of just trying to make your contribution, whether you're playing second, whether you're playing flat, whether you're playing a solo or whether you're just playing within the texture. I think everybody's contribution is absolutely vital. And so, um, you know, that there used to be that feeling, like, oh, well, if you're not a first player, then you're, you know, you're not the important one. I said, well, okay, I think it's lovely to be able to play some of the solos, but actually some of the most rewarding moments are when you're able to support that and help shape that and help drive that. And I think um, in terms of freedom that um, a conductor might give you, I think it's always very important to come with an idea of how you want to play something, to have made your connection with that in some way before. And to, I mean, I've worked out quite recently actually that my whole life is about pictures. I mean, I'm just governed by my imagination. So, um, I mean, I would, mostly never tell you what's going on there because it's probably quite disturbing but um i just you know you have this kind of innate connection with what you're playing and so i think you kind of offer that to a conductor and then be really open to how they might want to shape it and mold it i think to expect a conductor just to say to sort of always have to tell you how to play everything is a bit unreasonable when you know we're generally playing like hours worth of music and we don't have that much rehearsal so maximum contribution from everyone my way forward <laughs> Okay, so we have the results of our poll, which says um, ho chocolate hobnobs have won this time. So what's the answer there, Joe? You know what? This is really embarrassing, but I don't actually remember because I absolutely love jammy dodgers, malted milk, chocolate hobnobs, even chocolate hobnobs and digestive. So I don't know what one was my favourite. I'm really sorry. <laughs> I put them all in there because they're all your favourites. Yes. <laughs> You said they were all, but you couldn't single one out. So there, there we are. All your favourite. You didn't actually, I sneaked party rings in there. as a bit I, I would eat a whole packet of them as well, though. No problem. Really? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I sit there just sort of justifying it. Oh, well, then there's only another three. Well, there's only, well, I've only had six. Another three won't up and harm me. That's fine. And then once I've finished the packet, they're all gone, right? <laughs> gone. Amazing. Great. Well, thank you very much for that.
Okay, um, Simon, you have to play um, solos in the orchestra as a leader, and, and same with you, Kate, sometimes. How does that feel? You know, it's a funny thing, because I'm always aware that wind players play solos all the time, because there's one of each of their instruments, and yet when a solo comes along in a string, uh, part. It always feels like a really big deal. Um, and so I confess that, you know, I've always been really, really nervous, really terrified when you see a big solo coming up. Maybe it's because everyone in the orchestra is actually looking at you and everyone can see you, um, but one feels terribly exposed. And so if any of you out there ever get these string solos in, in the NCO, then don't worry if you feel quite nervous about it, because even hardened old men like me do still. Um, but one of the things I've discovered that really helps, actually, that makes you feel less alone, is to always play them with somebody else. It's very rare that the entire orchestra has stopped when you have your solo. Um, so even the most famous solos are often with the first oboe or with the first horn or with another cello solo. And as soon as you start to play them with somebody else, suddenly it becomes chamber music and very friendly things to do and a really lovely thing to do. So that's been the thing that kind of humanizes solos for me over the years is to work out who you're playing with and turn it into a piece of chamber music. Thank you, Simon. So, Kate, tell us about playing second violin. Why does second violins rule? Right. How long have we got? <laughs> um, okay, I've, I've, been, I've been trying to narrow this down, and I just can't, Kath, honestly, because the list is endless. You, you get to do, if you can think of something you can do in music, you can do it in the second violins. So, you play the tune, you support the tune, you define the tempo, you define the texture, you can, you just can do anything, and it's musically, um, the most versatile and integral role that I've ever experienced. You know, I think even some, you know, you get the bass line sometimes in, in certain string writing as well. Like it, it really is endlessly um, rewarding and um, intriguing and exciting and um, all, all the adjectives. Yeah. <laughs> all it. That's, that's great. Thank you for that. We've got a poll about you. Kate. When Kate was at school, she had a violin called Horace, Henry, Hector, Harry, Howard, or Harvey. So which one of those did she choose to name her violin? Have a little vote on that and we'll find out the answer in a minute. Top secret information you won't find out anywhere else in the world. Uh, Simon, tell us about the string sound in an orchestra. The string sound of an orchestra is the kind of cushion, isn't it? It's the kind of heart, the core, what, what defines an orchestra. What, how do you create a really great string sound? It's a good question because it's something all orchestras want to know the answer to. And actually what I found most interesting over the years playing in orchestras in different countries and in different cities in this country is that the string sound is different in every orchestra, which in a way is inevitable because it has different players. But I think orchestras maintain a string sound over years, even though the players are changing. And that means that new players come in and adopt to the sound that they're hearing. So I think there's very definitely a distinctive sound in each orchestra. Um, I think the most important thing is that people try and match the sounds that they're hearing around them. Um, so if you sit there and you're playing and you hear yourself sticking out above that texture, you're not matching. And the more an orchestra can blend its string sound, the more luxurious it sounds and the more wonderful it sounds. Um, and I think the important thing there is something to pick up on what Joe was saying, that everybody has to contribute. And I know there's a temptation that the further back you go, the less you offer. Um, and Kath and I both worked once with the same conductor, a wonderful guy, who um, told a story at the beginning of the rehearsal. And actually, he seems to have told this story to every orchestra he goes into. But his story was that he was, he was staying in a hotel and he's very upset to find that they put the toilet paper on the wrong, wrong way round. Um, which meant that when you pulled the toilet paper, it came out from underneath instead of from round over the top. Um, and he said that you should think of the string section like this toilet roll holder. So instead of the sound coming out from underneath, you want the sound to roll over the top of the section from the back desk to the front desk. And then you get this wonderful wave of sound. And I have to say that the best orchestras I've sat in, I felt these waves of sound coming over the top of my head. And it's the most wonderful feeling. So I think the further back you, you sit, don't dominate the section from the back seat but contribute to that sound of sort of waves of sound rolling forward. And for those sitting further forward, they'll really appreciate that. And it feels wonderful. Great. Thank you, Simon. So we've got the results of the poll. Uh, oh, it's a tie. It's a tie between Hector and Harvey, Kate. Uh, so do you want to tell us what the answer was? Yeah, it's really interesting because actually of that list of names, just then I voted for Horace, even though that's not the right answer. The right answer is Harry. Um, because my violin when I was at school was made by a, uh, 
a guy who lived in Sydney and his name was Harry Vitiliotis. So very imaginatively, I named my violin after the maker. <laughs> Great, why not? So I've actually got a quick question for you that's come in from Carlotta Kate. Um, she wants, she's asked, have you ever been scared of leading a section? That's a great question. Um, yes, I have. Um, when I was on trial, that's a very scary, that's a scary moment because you, you just don't know if, if you're going to click in that connection and things. But on the whole, I find it um, just a really exhilarating experience, something that I, I absolutely love. And I have to say with the seconds at the CBSO are just I think it's the best section in the country. And I'm not just saying that, you know, I, I really think they are. They're the most incredible people and players. And that's that's the easiest way to sit in a principal seat is when you've got this, in, you know, when, you, when you're part of an amazing team, you don't need to do anything. There's no I in team. That's the name of the game. <laughs> so that's kind of a question that's just been sent to me from Isabel, which says, what can you do to help the orchestra if you're not leading, uh, but you're just following the conductor? how how do you con how do you know that you're giving who would like to take that simon do you want to take that one yeah well i'm sure we've all got different ways of knowing the answer to this one but i think that if you feel you're playing your best and if you feel that the sound you're making is really contributing to the sound that's coming out of the orchestra and i think possibly if you imagine that you stopped playing would that make a difference to what's coming out and if it would make a difference to what's coming out then you're doing a good job if you stop playing and nobody noticed, then obviously you weren't really contributing very much. So I think that just imagine that what you're doing is really adding value to the sound that's coming out. Um, I think what really helps in the strings is having a really good relationship with your death partner and that together you're really doing something really positive as a team. Um, and that's one of the things I enjoy most is having that relationship with the death partner and really sort of building something together. Um, and that's quite exciting if you really go on that ride together. That can feel like you're playing a duet almost together, doesn't it? So you kind of play into each other's sounds and you can, even within the parameters of following a conductor and a leader and everybody else, you've still got a bit of space mm. to do your own thing and to have a bit of fun with it. And, and that's, that's where the joy comes of knowing that you're contributing, I think, from within because it, 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 one person can't do it on their own. It, it's, it is a team thing. And also because the orchestra is such a big unit. If you're sitting there as a leader, just one of 80, you might feel insignificant. But if you make your own little teams within that orchestra, then you can really feel like you're, you're part of something. And I think that's really, really nice. Exactly. Great. So I'm just going to do um, a little screen share to show you what the tutors have been up to on NCO Online, because there's been quite a lot of tutor fun going on. So let's see what the tutors have been up to. Some of you will have seen this uh, in, your, in your videos and in your tutors. So there's Tony, Tony Rob, who's <laughs> playing the senior flutes. He's practicing his mambo there with his bunting and his hat and his shades. So the mambo, um, for you guys, you might not know, we're recording a massive multi-track mambo for, with the whole of 450 musicians of NCO. So it's going to be super cool. And there's Arlene, who is very cool as well. Um, she's our se uh, senior and junior trombone coach. So she's um, got all her trombone. Um, apparently the, the mambo is in quite a tricky key for trombones. So there's a lot of different things they have to know. So they're up on the wall, on the wall behind. Here's Letty, who's our senior horn, looking cool again, rehearsing her mambo. Now look at that, that's Mel. She's our junior, uh, our junior viola. Look, team viola, you can see in her teddies and her balloons and her lights and look at her. I've never been in a section all that fun in my life. I don't know if you guys have, but, and there's <laughs> Connie, look. She's having a bit of fun with the mambo as well. And look, I, I, she, we can't hold Connie back. She, every, every, every time she pops up, she's wearing something different. And look at Gemma. Now Gemma <laughs> is uh, in the bath, apparently, for no apparent reason, because she loves scuba diving and is missing it and wants to share that with her students. So, and here is the lovely Claire. Now, some of you will have watched already the um, video. If you haven't, you must watch it of how to do the call and response section in the mambo, because it's a section where the percussion play, play a rhythm and then the whole orchestra have to have to play that rhythm back. And you can play it on all different sorts of things. And here she is playing it with a hairbrush on her T-Rex. So you can watch that video. And so that's the end of our tutor fun for now. We'll come back and see what you kids have been up to in a minute. Okay. So Joe, um, as a second player in an orchestra, what do you want from your first player? Imagine you're sitting next to your dream first player, which I'm sure you do all the time. What, what <laughs> is, makes that really comfortable? What, what do you love? Um, it's a really good question. Um, because we had a vacancy in the CBSO for a first clarinet for a really long time, actually. So 
I was in a very unusual situation that I got to sit next to hundreds of different clarinet players and not just from this country, from really all over the world. So it really helped inform what I wanted and what I thought worked best within the parameters of the whole section. And I think um, quite often I come back to the same kind of um, adjectives. I think generosity, openness, um, flexibility, and a kind of, I think there's a feeling sometimes that when you're playing first um, or you have a solo line, that you can get a bit worried about that. And so you, you get a little bit insular and you, you concentrate so much on what you're doing that perhaps you forget about what's around you. And I think the most generous musicians always keep that completely balanced so that they bring everybody else into that journey with them. And so if somebody plays, you know, if our first clarinet, I am so super lucky to have the most fantastic first clarinet. He is everything that I've just described that I wanted. So um, super, super lucky. But over the years, um, the ones that I felt a real connection with, the ones that I felt that I'm in the journey with, that I'm right live in that moment with, have shared those characteristics. Great, thank you, Joe. We've had an amazing question, which is very thoughtful actually from Max. Um, is there more to think about when you are leading a section or when you're at the back of a section? What a good question that is. How um, would you like to take that, Kate, more to think about at the back or more to think about at the front? What do you think? I, I don't know if more, more or less are, are the right parameters. I think it's just different. You know, I don't think you ever have less to think about because that's implying that maybe it's less important, which is just not true, categorically untrue. So, I mean, I've, I've sat in, I've sit, sat at the back of a section, I've sat in the middle of a section, I've sat at the front of a section. I can safely say I've never tried less in one position or the other, but just maybe what I'm trying to do is slightly different in those roles. I hope that answers it. Great. Thank you, brilliant. So that's our first section, um, the roles part of what's in an auction. Now we're gonna move on, we're running out of time because we had to start a little bit late, but we're gonna to have to, are you guys all right to stay a few minutes longer if we, if we need to? Sorry to keep you away from the beach. <laughs> Joanne. Uh, <it's> <laughs> um, no, we I'm might carry on just five or 10 minutes longer just to make up for the slow start. Um, so the next topic is relationships, okay, within, within orchestras, and mainly the relationships that we all have as musicians with our conductors. Um, could you each give us one essential quality of a conductor? What would you say, Jo? I'm going to say the same one, generosity. Great. Simon, what would you say? Um, I was going to say charisma which is a difficult one to pin down, but you, you have to believe in the conductor and you have to want to follow them and, and make music with them. And I think charisma is actually, in the end, quite important. Very good. And Kate, what would you say, one quality? I, I would say clarity, but I mean that um, I don't mind if someone's not always really clear in terms of what beats where, but musical clarity, I think, as well. Great. Excellent. Uh, so, Simon, are conductors there to control orchestras, would you say? So, um, I think not. And I've got two examples that I'm going to give you um, of what I've worked with two very controlled conductors over the years. The first one had a habit um, of making a face at people that made a mistake. Um, he didn't like mistakes. And so, yeah, it's shocking. I can see Kate's shocked. It was shocking when I first saw it, but it got worse and worse over the years. And so, you know, even in a rehearsal and even in a concert, you know, if the horn split a note or the oboe squawked, but he'd go like this while he was conducting, as if to say, yeah, I've noticed you. Um, and it was really, really destructive. And I noticed I used to go and visit this orchestra once or twice a year. And every time I went back, the morale had just got a bit lower and a bit lower and a bit lower. And the priority was just not to make a mistake, so as not to have this humiliation. So that's one thing not to do. But what he was really trying to do was just to exert control over everything that happened in a really negative way. Um, another conductor member used to, um, always say don't do this don't do that so you say don't play so loudly here don't do that there don't do this there um, and I, I used to sit there and think why isn't this working and then it occurred to me that if he, instead of that he would say please come create a beautiful sound here that you know sounds like you know x y or z give you something really positive to try and achieve that would have been completely the opposite effect and I noticed also that this orchestra just sort of got basically completely fed up with him. Um, and so both of these really controlling conductors had completely the opposite effect that they are after. So I think a conductor is actually there to enable us 
to do the maximum that we can, to do the best we can. And everyone who goes to play an orchestra is there because they love music. They want to contribute and they want to play beautifully. Um, and so whether you're conducting or whether you're leading a section or whether you're directing an orchestra, I think it's really important to think about how you address the players and how much control you really need to exert. And I think the answer is less than you thought, um, but just to let people take flight is the best way. Uh -huh. So we've got a poll to find out a secret about Simon. They, they get voting very quickly. So Simon <laughs> would secretly love to be a judge on The Voice, Dragon's Den, Britain's Got Talent, the Eurovision Song Contest, or Strictly Come Dancing. Okay, so we'll find out whether which of those he would love to be on in a minute. Um, I've just worked out how to vote, so that's excellent. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Brilliant, brilliant. So you can vote now. That's excellent. Yeah. Okay, so Kate, could you tell us about conductors that take risks in performance? How does that work? I, I think it can go one of two ways, as in well or just terribly but i think the idea of a risk if you've got a conductor who takes a risk then you're talking about a conductor who has real rapport with the musicians and the way you take take a risk i think with an orchestra is you go on the ride with them you go on that you know through the concert through the piece you're you're on the same roller coaster and it might get to a point where there's a gap in the track at the top of a hill and you all hold your breath in the same way. You know, I, I was actually, sorry, this is a shameless plug, but I watched our prom cat from 2017 of Beethoven 5. And, you know, after the famous, ba -ba -ba -ba, ba -ba -ba -ba, it's the second violin to start. And every time we do it, you know, it'll be in a different way. But in that particular performance, at the very end of the movement, suddenly, Mirga held this crazy silence where you just, but it was, you know, you take a risk with the players because you're, you're there together. So those are some of the most exciting moments, aren't they? When you actually literally feel like you're all, you're all taking that risk together. <laughs> Maybe about to be sick as well, but like, yeah, <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> right. Let's see what Simon's secret is. Here we go. Um, he most people think you want to be on Britain's Got Talent, um, Simon. Although quite close behind is Strictly Come Dancing. You could be up there with um, Bruno and Darcy Bustle. How about that? Or Dragon's Den, uh, twenty-two percent. Eurovision, fifteen percent, and The Voice, six percent. So, drum roll, Simon. Can you tell us which one you'd actually like to be on? The answer is Dragon's Den. Um, my confession is I've never watched Britain's Got Talent. Um, so I'm not quite sure about that one. Maybe I would love to be a judge on that, but I love Dragon's Den. I don't know, there's something about it. I love the fact they're so mean to each other and everything that comes on is so interesting and makes me want to be an entrepreneur. Um, so it's quite possible some of you haven't watched it, but it's great fun. My secret vice well, is watching you. Dragon's Den. <laughs> Thank you for that secret. Okay, I'm just gonna do a quick screen share of what our kids have been up to. Um, so we're moving on from tutor fun, we're moving on now to kids fun. So what have you been up to? Let's see. These are some pictures um, from the last webinar selfie, which we did a few weeks ago, which was with um, Hetty and Ailish Tynan from the Royal Opera House. Uh, and we had a lot of fun. So here's a few of you guys with your pictures from that webinar. And we're going to do the selfie like this at the end of this one. So if you're new to our webinars, all you need to do is either get a prop or something fun um, and you can come and we'll have our selfie moment where we all pose and you can take your pictures with us and then we'll see where you were and what you were up to while you were watching the webinar. And there's, um, uh, I think he's called Fluffles this chicken. He's made quite a few appearances in their, in their posts and so we, we like seeing him. And this is, um, actually a mum who wanted to get in on the action, who was a bit jealous of her daughter having all the fun. So she joined in too. And you've been participating in everything that's on our website. So this is one of the colorings that we've had from Lana Jackson. Thank you for sending that, it's beautiful. Um, we'll upload all these things onto the gallery on the website so you can all have a good look. And some of you have been doing the pick and mix taskmaster challenge. And the first one I think was about finding something unusual in your instrument case. And look, V here has found, found her NCO hoodie in her case and put that on. And look, Clara found a puppy in her violin case. How mad is that? And Greg found, now this is a bit of a trick because Greg found his French horn in a guitar case. How about that? And Grace found this unusual cactus, looks like a sort of guinea pig cactus thing <laughs> in her case. And finally, look, Sammy found a vacuum cleaner in his case. So 
there. Keep them coming. We're loving seeing all those fun things that you're doing at home. Keep sharing them and they will all go on our website. Um, and quickly while I'm in the screen share, um, we'll just go on now to um, preparation. Now preparation is our final topic. Very important. Uh, Simon, why should we prepare? For I think the most there are two reasons I wanted to talk about preparation. One is to earn the respect of the people around you, but also to show respect to the people around you, because there's nothing more irritating to be sitting next to someone that clearly hasn't prepared and keeps making mistakes. It's incredibly distracting um, and very, very annoying um, for everybody around you. So I think it's really important to show the respect to your colleagues and to earn their respect that you've prepared. But the more you prepare, the more liberated you feel, the more free you can be, and the more fun it is. Um, once you've prepared your part, you're able to listen and respond and look around the orchestra and it just gives you the tools to be able to actually properly enjoy playing. And I remember not preparing very much when I was younger and just sitting there and feeling stressed and struggling and wishing I knew the piece better. Um, so there's nothing better than being really well prepared, I have to say. As I get older, I prepare more and more and more um, and it becomes more and more fun, actually. Great. So, um, Joe, do you want to tell us why, why you think it's important to prepare? Well, for all of those reasons, of course, um, but also I think, um, you know, excerpts are a really important part of our preparation, aren't they? But it's like how, how we get to glimpse what might be tricky for us in what we're about to play. And so being able to listen to that in context and being able to just get a little bit ahead of the game before you go to the rehearsal, I think makes a massive difference. The other thing is, as I know is really important to you as well, Kat, is just this idea of contradiction. Again, I feel, although my life is definitely made in pictures, um, it is also just full of contradiction. And I think that idea of being completely prepared or as prepared as you can be in terms of what you need to do yourself, then gives you flexibility, then gives you freedom, then gives you the chance to react and go on this wonderful roller coaster journey that we all hope every concert will be made up of. Fantastic. Oh, look, we've got a final poll. Um, this one says, <laughs> One of our guests checks their bed every night for spiders. Who is it? Okay. So we're going to find out which one of you doesn't like spiders. Okay, let's go too quickly to our list um, of things and, and work through this just quickly while we've got a final few minutes. Um, understanding style. Simon, do you want to kick us off? Yeah, just briefly, I think that, you know, every composer has a style. And I think if you're playing a piece by a composer that you've never played before, it really helps to listen to other pieces by that composer. Um, so, for example, composers like Elgar, when you first see what's written, it's very detailed and it's hard to work out what they mean. If you listen to other pieces, you just start to understand what they're on about, what that means, what their style is. And actually, even within the same composer, if you have a piece by Mozart, for example, in G minor, if you go and listen to other pieces by Mozart in G minor, suddenly you understand that world of his. And there's very special language sometimes when he writes in the minor key. So finding similar pieces by the same composer just really helps you to get a sense of what it is you're playing, rather than just looking at what's on that particular page. Great. Thank you. Can we whiz through these now? Oh, we've got two number ones. That's weird. Sorry, that's my mistake. So number one, number two, number one. <laughs> Excerpts. <laughs> I think I just kind of covered that though. So maybe I just jumped the gun. But um, I think definitely that whole thing about just being on what those tricky passages are is always got to be um, a really vital part of preparation. And number two? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think I think carrying on from what Joe was saying, you know, that when you're preparing your own part, there's no point in polishing things that are already beautiful. So you've got to zoom in on the things that are nitty gritty, make sure they're all ready to go. And I think preparing, it's important to know your own part, but it's also really important to segue into number three, to listen to the whole part. Because if you if you only know your own, what you're doing, then you're not going to be a, a really well-oiled cog and clicking in with everything around you so I think listening to you know whatever piece you're going to play listen to it with your part make sure you understand it and then just put the music away and, and let the whole score be part of your preparation and number four Simon do you want to talk about playing along yeah well this is something that I still do all the time if I'm learning a new piece and it's amazing now we have this YouTube and you can have it on the TV that I try and play along with as many different orchestras playing that piece on YouTube films and recordings as I can and even if you just find one and play along with it 
Um, it's the best way to learn an orchestral part, I think, is to play along with an orchestra on YouTube. Um, and if you've got time to do one or two different recordings, that's even more helpful because you realise there's more than one way to do everything that you play. Um, but it's an incredibly fast way to learn something. You can have the score alongside, that's even better. And Kate, do you want to talk rhythm? Sorry, sorry, jumping in at number five, I'm very slow. Um, yes, basically, I am Captain Metronome and I cannot overstate the importance of internal rhythm. Practice with your metronomes, it's just so good for you. It's the, I mean, I know they change speed, but they don't. So just keep at it because it, it is incredibly helpful, both for you and for everyone around you. <laughs> and finally, Joe on character. So I think maybe character is just linked in with everything else that we've just talked about, actually, because I think, um, you know, it's understanding different characters and different styles that is really one of the hardest things to do. You know, when your teacher says, oh, but you need to play this in a more kind of Hungarian way, or you need to play this in a more French way, or you need to play like a German waltz. And you're going, yeah, but I don't know what any of that is. And so I think kind of doing the research about listening to lots of other things and working out and listening to other people play those excerpts, I think really helps inform you of what that character is going to be. And I think, um, again, when you can play with the right kind of character, I think it just enables you to have so much more fun. Imagine you trying to play this mambo, this huge mambo that you're doing, and you try to approach that like Beethoven 5 it's not going to work. You have to get in touch with your Latin self. You have to be free. You have to move. You just have to have a great time. But of course, bearing in mind everything that everybody's just said, prepare, learn, and play it rhythmically. Life's contradictions. Brilliant. <laughs> Great, thank you. So we, we've nearly, we've really run out of time, but uh, looking at our poll, let me share the results of the poll. Uh, it says that most people think it's Kate that checks her bed for spiders. <laughs> and 39% Joe and only 16% Simon. So um, do you want to give us the answer? Joe, do you want to give us the answer? absolutely me. <laughs> <laughs> Every night, wherever I am, up the covers, up the pillows, everything. Yeah. Have you Good. ever found nice. one? Yeah. This was because this was because my friend a long time ago, um, we, we did a sleepover in somewhere, I don't know, I think we were in the US, and she said, you know what? Every year you swallow at least two spiders, and that was it. So sorry if I've given you all now the same habit of checking your bed every night for spiders, but I definitely don't think it's worth the risk. <laughs> Right, very quickly before we do our final uh, our, our webinar selfie, I've just got to tell you about our next webinar, which is on Friday at 4.30. And look, we have these amazing guests joining us. Um, Tamsin Gregg, uh, the actor, and Bill Bailey, the actor, musician, comedian. And they're going to be on talking to us about how what musicians can learn from actors, um, about being spontaneous on stage and about all sorts of, I don't know what yet, all sorts of other amazing things. So there they are, look, both on Graham Norton's couch and how lucky are we to have them on our very own webinar on Friday. So that's at 4.30, I think, on Friday. So please make sure you come and join us for that one. And so it just leads us to do, quickly do our selfie, guys, because we're running out of time. We've already okay. run out of time. So um, could you don whatever it is you're gonna wear for your selfie? Great, we've all got some fun things to put on. Look, oh, look at Joe, she's in her full PPE because she's in Spain. And oh, okay, okay, I'll count us down and do something funny. And, and then, if everyone could take as many selfies out there as possible and send them in to us, we'll put them on the website and, and we'll share them with you all later. So, three, two, one. <laughs> there we go, fantastic. Great. Well, thank you ever so much, um, Simon, Kate and Joe, for giving us your time today. And um, it's been such a treat to have you. We could, of course, like all these webinars, have talked for hours and hours and hours. But I think we've started to scrape the surface of some of the uh, interesting things and sophistication of what it means to play in an orchestra. So a huge, huge thank you from all of us at NCO to all of you guys. And um, have you. a very happy rest of the summer. And um, we'll see you very soon. Bye. Bye. Bye.